I want to begin by telling you a little story, and it's a true story, and it involves two soldiers, and we'll call them Corporal A, and we'll call them Private B. And Corporal A and Private B were on a training exercise on Salisbury Plain, and as these things often do, it involved a, a long run carrying heavy equipment. Well, Private B was lagging behind a bit, and so Corporal A decided to give him a bit of encouragement, which was some cheery words and a clip round the ear. Well, things carried on, and the exercise was completed, and a couple of hours later, uh, they were back at camp. And Corporal A sat down, had a cup of tea with his uh, mates, and Private B also sat down, but he didn't have a cup of tea. What he did was he assembled his trenching tool, and to the uninitiated, that's really a very small pickaxe. Having assembled his pickaxe, he wandered up behind Corporal uh, A and embedded it in the back of his head. Uh, to take a straw poll um, of you, having heard what I think the principles of vicarious liability are, as to those of you who in the audience think that the Ministry of Defence should be or would be held liable for the acts of um, Private B. And the question, therefore, what is the rationale behind vicarious liability? One thing I think that is clear is that it's a very fluid principle. And the Supreme Court has looked at the uh, doctrine recently. It's a case called Various Claimants Against the Institute of the Brothers of the Christian Schools. The law of vicarious liability is on the move. So it is a developing area. It's a sign of uh, age on my part, but when I studied tort at university in the first cases I did at the bar about vicarious liability, uh, the principles that were involved were first you had to show a relationship uh, of employment or agency, and then secondly you had to show that the employee was acting within the scope uh, of their employment rather than being on a frolic of their own. And the question that was often asked is whether the employee was carrying out an authorised act in an unauthorised way. The problem with that formulation of the law was that it didn't fit easily with deliberate wrongdoing. And what has happened is there's been a sequence of cases, uh, many of them involving child abuse, which has led to a significant incremental change in the law. And it seems to me that current thinking suggests that there are two separate but interrelated questions that have to be considered when you address vicarious liability. The first is whether the relationship is one which is capable of giving rise to vicarious liability. And the second strand is whether the connection between the relationship and the tortious act is so close that it would be fair and just to impose liability. If you're on the claimant side of the fence, the last 12 months have been a pretty negative experience. Um, when I spoke at this conference last year, uh, there was still some vague hope that some parts of Jackson might actually not come into effect. There was certainly a real hope um, that what I'm about to talk to you about wouldn't take effect. In fact, I think it was about April of this year, uh, the House of Lords, by a majority of two, initially rejected the enterprise reforms we're going to talk about. Anyone who thinks that government is ineffective should look at how quickly that bill was re returned to the House of Lords after passing back through the House of Commons, and now is in effect. The 1st of October, which takes me to my first slide, uh, is the trigger date for possibly the most major change to personal injury litigation in respect of liability most people in this room are going to see. Uh, Section 69 of the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act 2013 is the source of the change. Uh, the regulations are not 
repealed. They're simply stripped of effect. <coughs> and they remain, as a result, by and large, subject to criminal sanctions. So in the slightly unusual position in which you can be injured as a result of the breach of regulations that lead to a criminal conviction, uh, you can rely on that criminal conviction to the extent it helps you uh, when you bring your civil claim. But what you won't be able to do is say, thank you very much. I may well have been very silly when I had this accident. There may have been nothing that you could have done to prevent it. But I'd like my money, please. And that kind of approach to employer's liability is completely gone. An employee will still be able to say, I don't have to sue the manufacturer of any work equipment that hurts me. I can sue my employer if I can show that there is a breach of the standard of care in relation to the equipment. It's a little bit strange because at the same time as the main emphasis is tilted towards attempting to reduce cost, this is going to be a very expensive change. Uh, there's going to be an awful lot more uncertainty. There are many personal injury actions that you see at the moment in which when I first get the papers and fairly soon after the letter of claim, liability is admitted. And the reason liability is admitted is because liability is strict. My main headline, though, is this. I expect far more employers' liability cases to fight and to end up in the court system in respect of liability. I'll start with the Fred Perry case. Um, I know it's not since April of this year. In fact, it's not even since April of last year. This was February of last year. Um, district judge, who'd obviously had his training early, um, refused a relief, uh, an application for relief from sanction for breach from unless order. Uh, the Court of Appeal uh, supported his decision. The reason we all know it is, of course, that Lord Justice Jackson, who was obviously sitting as a wingman in the Court of Appeal, I suspect didn't take very great part in it, but couldn't resist throwing in a final dig into the judgment to say um, there's a feeling that district judges have been far too quick to grant relief from sanction, and they should stop doing so. And from April of next year, they're going to have to stop doing so, and the Court of Appeal should be really strong in supporting robust case management decisions from DJs. The and DAS case and the Hannon and Hillingdon Holmes case those are both cases that deal with um, surveillance evidence. In DAS and DAS, the defendant sat on their medical evidence. I mean, to say they sat on it is a bit of an understatement. They served it two years after the deadline for service. Um, they said to the uh, master when they were making their application to serve it late, well, we did it deliberately because we needed the time to put the claimant under surveillance and we wanted the time to have really good surveillance on the claimant. And then we wanted the medical experts to have a look at it before we served the whole lot. And the master said, no, you can't, and you can't rely on your evidence. Uh, and the High Court judge on appeal agreed with that. Whereas in Hannon and Hillingdon Holmes, presumably a different master, but it's not quite clear because I don't know who the master was in DAS, um, the defendant tipped up to the CMC and said, yesterday we served all the <coughs> surveillance on the claimant. They haven't had a chance to look at it yet because it only went in the DX yesterday, but they really need to. Um, therefore, we want to extend the time for serving our medical evidence. Claimant, unsurprisingly, said, well, you're going to have to satisfy the 3.9 criteria. But in that case, you've got a master saying, well, look, the surveillance is important. You're telling me that I can't see it. You're telling me no one's telling me what's in it. All I can do sensibly is adjourn the CMC to another date. The high point for all of us is Rayan Al Iraq Company Limited versus Trans Victory Marine. It's a case in which the claimant um, was two days late serving the claim form and the defendant uh, sought to get them struck out. And in that case, the judge said the following that it would be a disproportionate response uh, and it would give the defendants an unjustified windfall to strike out. Now, if any of you, if the words disproportionate response and unjustified windfall don't feature in your current applications for relief from sanction, go back to the office and get them in your witness statement three times. Because I was once told that if you say that somebody said something three times to a judge, they will believe it is true.
So if you make what you think is going to be an application for an extension of time to comply with an order, thinking that you're going to make it under 3.12a, in other words, an extension of time, I can tell you now what you will be met with a district, is a district judge saying the time for compliance has already expired. Complying within the time is a necessary precondition to your entitlement to rely on this evidence at all. Therefore, the effect of that original order is that it's effectively a court sanction. And therefore, I'm going to treat this application as an application for relief under 3.9. My own experience is that that appears to be an absolutely uniform approach by district judges. I think there's just something else I'd add slightly there. Your point about agreeing it with your opponent or the other side the culture doesn't seem quite to have fully registered with some defendant fee earners and indeed perhaps some members of the bar. So if you get the chance to agree an extension, that is always going to be a much better position to be in when you're then trying to persuade the court to endorse it uh, than if you're actually trying to persuade the court to endorse it while someone's opposing it. In Biffa, there's delay without explanation. In Michael against Middleton, there's a failure to comply with an unless order. And again, no explanation. Um, the Ravaja, similarly, there is initially uh, no explanation. And it's only the second bite where they provide the explanation that they are allowed in. Uh, Calvinda Das against Satish Das. Again, it's a double default failure to comply and that being deliberate. Unfortunately, so far as costs budgeting cases are, the position is quite different, and the courts have adopted the position that where even minor defaults or relatively minor defaults mean you don't get your budget or something quite disastrous can happen to your case. So I start with Andrew Mitchell, MP, against News Group. I think this case is fairly well known. Certainly the, the plebgate facts are well known, the costs perhaps less so. But what Andrew Mitchell's solicitors failed to do was to file their costs budget seven days before the CMC, the first costs hearing. Despite the full explanation, despite the minor nature of the failure, it's one day before the CMC instead of seven, despite the total lack of prejudice to the defendant, he is still limited to his court fees only. At present, it's vital that everyone files their uh, Form H is in advance of the CMC. Better option, and the best option, indeed provided in the practice direction, is that you should try and agree your budgets with the other side. Now, B, and I would encourage a spirit of cooperation between parties in agreeing budgets, because it is... The real losers, if you don't agree, your budgets in a meaningful sense are, are both parties. Defendants, I think, have adopted the losers in the case are the clients on either side and, and ultimately uh, the lawyers more than anyone. Do, do please stay and have a, a drink or something in the museum and people will show you where to go for there. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>